Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. Matthew chapter 24, and we're entering into a place that I will say at least for me is, is tricky in that I'm not positive that I know exactly what it means. So I'm going to say some things that are going to lead up to what I think this is. It won't be in this particular episode. It'll be leading up to the next episode of the Watchman broadcast. And it's taken me a while to sort of put all of this together. So I'm going to give what I think is my best shot at it. Now I've read a lot of different uh, material. I've heard a lot of different prophecy scholars, prophecy speakers, all giving their idea of what the abomination of desolation is, which is in Matthew 24, 15. Let's read the scriptures. I, I'm starting in verse 12 here in my notes, but I'm going to read verse 12, 13, 14, 15 together because I think that these first two verses, verses 12 and 13, lead up to sort of the explanation behind what the abomination of desolation is in verse 15. Let's read the scriptures. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, very important, I believe, the love of many shall wax cold. That also, I think, is very important. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Sort of reminds you of Noah, right? Noah endured unto the end. And why did Noah endure? Was it because he had a different gospel, the way some people say that he had to endure to be saved? No. The Bible makes it clear that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And anyone who finds grace, it's never then about their works that saves them. It's about the faith that they have through the grace of God that God gives them the strength to endure unto the end, no matter what happens. And I guess you could say that as far as happening is a concern, the end of the world by flood was pretty much the most biggest happening that had ever happened up until the days of Noah. And, and I guess up until now, only something far worse is going to happen. We're going to have the end of the world through fire and through everything else that's going on. But definitely it was grace that brought Noah unto the end. Okay. And then he said, Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And there's a lot of things that could be said about this. Number one, we know, we know that the disciples to whom Jesus was speaking right here at this particular time, let's say it was 32 AD, somewhere around in there. We know they didn't see it. So whoever he was talking to, he was saying that people in general, possibly all over the world, would all see the same thing. They would see an event that takes place that God's people, I believe, would recognize it as the abomination that maketh desolation. Now, here's one thing I do know about this, is that we don't all have to agree as to exactly what this is. I may have my opinion. You may have your opinion. Jack Bad MP may have his, his opinion. 
Uh, Charles Ryrie may have his opinion. Donald Duck may have his opinion. And they all have these all different opinions. But here's one thing I know, that when this event actually happens, all of those who are really God's people will say, that's the abomination that maketh desolation. That's it right there. That, that fulfills every scripture. I believe when we see it, we'll know it. It's just like all of us Bible-believing Christians, we've never seen Jesus a day in our life. We don't know what he looks like. I've had dreams where I could tell you that I think Jesus was in the dream. I don't know if it was some dream from God or not. I just know that Jesus was in the dream. Never could see his face. So I've never seen the face of Jesus. And yet, I guarantee you, those of us who believe the word of God, all of us will recognize him when he appears. We've never seen the Antichrist. We don't know who he is. But I guarantee you, the day that he's revealed, God's people are going to say, that's the Antichrist and that's Jesus. And we can tell the difference. That's, that's what I believe. So on the things that I'm going to say, no matter how wrong I might be, when the abomination of desolation takes place, rest assured, we'll know it. Now, he says, he starts out, verses 12 and 13, giving some of the things that are going to lead up to that. Remember when the series that we did with Manasseh, the king. And Manasseh from, he became king at what, 12 years old? And already as a young boy, he starts getting into the occult. He starts getting into uh, divination. He starts getting into seeking after wizards and familiar spirits. And when he has children, he starts passing them through the fire. And he's doing all these things. And I re remember telling you there was 13 things sort of like the pyramid the all, with the all-seeing eye on it, 13 rows that build up to where the all-seeing eye is going to be. And that's how the devil operates. He operates in levels, like in Freemasonry. You can't know the secret they're going to tell you in the 33rd degree. You can't know that secret way down in the second degree or the third degree down in the Blue Lodge. They're not going to tell you that. You have to work your way up to it. And that's what I see Manasseh doing. He's working his way up through magic and occult, and he's learning this, and he's, and he's getting more and more spirits on him, and the spirits are finally going to give his approval to finally he does what no other king of Israel ever did, even though some of them made their children pass through the fire, and some of them did divination, and some of them did astrology. Manasseh was the only one that said, I'm going to cross the line. And he actually put an image, an idol that he himself had made and put it in the most holy place of the temple. What was he thinking? Because he, like I said, he did something that none of the other predecessors ever dared to do. But he had gotten so deep into the occult that that's what they led him to. Now, I believe that there will come a time in man's future when all of mankind is ready to receive the abomination of desolation, to receive the mark of the beast, readily receive it. See, we got a lot of people saying right now that certain things, and I won't talk about them because I promised I wouldn't talk about them anymore because there's such a sharp division on this. And I can't influence you. You can't influence me. So I'm just going to drop it for a while. But there's things going on right now. People are saying, this is the mark of the beast and they're going to force it on everybody. And I don't believe that. I believe that mankind is, as a whole, 
as one single entity, all of mankind who are going to receive the mark are going to be brought to a place to where they all are willing to receive it 100% voluntarily. They all are going to want this. But if I were to say the mark of the beast is out, now it's being tested, and boy, there's a lot of people that swear they'd rather die before they take this. I don't think we're there yet then. I don't think the mark of the beast is ready to be put out on a mass scale because you've got a ton of people who've already said they're not going to take it. But I guarantee you, when the mark of the beast is ready to be presented to the world, the world is going to eat it up and there'll be no resistance from anybody. And here's what leads to that. Here's what's leading up to the abomination that maketh desolation. And people either seeing that as the most wonderful thing that's ever happened or, uh uh-oh, God's fixing to come down. He says it in verse 12, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, when I read that, it reminded me of a different time in the scriptures. Remember what Jesus said? He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And if we go back to Genesis chapter 6, I have verse 5 in my notes here, but let's read um, the first part of Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. So we know that event happened and that sort of set off a series of events. And then God said in verse 3, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in 120 years. So let's say that God sees now the sons of God, these evil angels, mating and marrying these human women and producing giant offspring. God looks at that and says, You know, I know it's not time yet. But I guarantee in 120 years from now, this earth, because of this event, this earth will be so corrupt that it will not be worth saving. There will be no way that I will ever be able to, and I'm God, and I won't be able to convince mankind to forsake what's happening on this earth and follow me. Now, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and those babies started being born, it may not have been time yet for God to turn the whole world over and destroy them. But he said, I bet you in 120 years, in fact, I guarantee you in 120 years, this earth will not be worth saving. You see, just because the giants started being born That doesn't mean it was time right then and there to start destroying everybody. But God knew the clock has started counting down to the time when man would be unredeemable. So then look what he, we know what he says in verse four, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men um, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So from that time, the clock started ticking down 120 years, 119 years, 118 years, 100 years, 50 years, 25 years. And as that clock is ticking, mankind is becoming worse and worse and worse. I'm going to ask, let's let's do something right now. 120 years ago from this year, 2021, would be 19, 
1901, okay? Were women walking around in really, really, really short, tight shorts in public with halter tops? No, absolutely not, okay? Um, however, in 1901, they had developed means of mass communication. In other words, the telegraph had been invented. Now we can send news all over the world. Pretty soon the telephone's going to be invented if it hasn't already. Not too long after that, the radio and the radio had an effect upon people because they're hearing things. Their children are hearing things for the first time that their mom and dads would never let them hear, especially after the transistor was invented and kids could carry radios in their pockets and listen to rock music all day long without mom and dad knowing about it. And then television, and then cable television, and then the internet. And so here we are 120 years later from 1901, and in 1901, you had a fairly decent society. But in the year 2021, it's not that way. So does 120 years make a big difference? Yes, it does. So this is, what, this is what's going on. So God said in verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now think of, think of the younger generation now. 14, 15, 16, 17 year old, 18, 19, 20 year old kids who constantly have pods in their ears listening to the most vulgar music you, that has ever been dreamed up. They're sitting around looking at images on their phone and tablets that only adult men used to look at out in the garage where their wife couldn't see it or kids would run down in the woods and hide them and they're in their clubhouse and hide them. Now they can sit in bed all night and watch this stuff. Is that going to have a corrupting effect on society in general? Absolutely. And it's going to get to a point soon. I mean, we're already talking about the brain interface, right? Where the brain interfaces with the World Wide Web. Boy, just think about that, guys. You're afraid that your wife is going to catch you with some of the stuff, the images and the videos you've been looking at on your tablet or on your phone, but if they're beamed directly into your brain, your wife would never catch you. And you could be sitting there in your living room with your wife, having porn put directly into your brain. Nobody would ever know. Is it going to corrupt this world to a point to where God says they're unredeemable? Absolutely. And that it's going to bring in the abomination that maketh desolation. So he says again, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He says it in verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Verse 11, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. You know, there used to be a time on TV shows where, like you would have police dramas or detective dramas way back in the 50s, where they would never show you a dead body. They would just, like, have, a, have it covered up, and they would pull the covers up, and you couldn't see the body because... Back then, that was considered horrific and vulgar to display a dead body on television. That was just considered horrible. Now we have kids that are shooting everything inside in video games. 
and it's only getting worse. The violence of this world is getting worse. The adultery of this world is getting worse. Everything is getting worse to where the day will come when man will become completely unredeemable. And that, I believe, is when the abomination of desolation will occur. So he says again in verse 11, the earth was also corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence and God looked upon the earth. Behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way on the earth. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And Jesus said this, when, when Jesus said that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Ask yourself the question, we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 here in a minute, so you can open your Bible there while I say this. <clears throat> when somebody gets hooked on, let's say, heroin or methamphetamine, do they care about anybody else? Nah. A teenager or a 20-year-old living at home, living with his grandparents, whatever, when he gets hooked on these drugs, He'll steal whatever money he can get his hands on, even stealing from his own grandparents. For me to ever consider stealing from my grandparents, the thought never even entered my mind because I wasn't hooked on drugs. But as people's sins, their personal sins increase, they love less and less the people around them, including their dearest friends and family members, and they only love themselves. Because that's what sin does. As iniquity increases in a person, that person's love for anybody else in the world ceases, and the only person they love is themselves. Paul warned us about the exact same thing. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Why are they perilous? Because people don't give a hoot about you, about your life, about anything. It'll be dangerous just to go to bed at night because somebody who wants in your house to steal your stuff, to get drugs, they don't care who you are. They'll kill you in a heartbeat just to be able to steal your stuff or to gratify themselves somehow, some way. Perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. You know, you know what that word means? Like if a, a patient is in the hospital, and the nurse comes in and says they're incontinent, it means that they don't have the ability to control their bowel or bladder functions. And in this case, the word incontinent means that they have absolutely no ability whatsoever to stop sinning. An alcoholic, you put a drink in front of him, there's not a chance in the world he's going to say, no, I'm not going to drink that. He's going to drink it. He cannot cease from sin. And that's what Peter and Jude said about the false teachers and those that followed them in the last days. They're incontinent. They cannot cease from sin. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, which is what we have going on in our country right now. We have judges, congressmen, legislators, governors, you name it, we have it. We have people in this country who are absolutely traitors to the Constitution of the United States of America, and they swore an oath 
saying they would defend the Constitution. They lied through their teeth. And do you know what causes that? The increase of personal sins causes that. Traitors, heady, high-minded. There it is. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And I would submit to you that whatever your family church, your home church, the church that your mom and daddy and your grandma lived, uh, went to 70 years ago, 100 years ago, I guarantee you that church now, because of the abundance of sin that is in it, that church cares more about personal lust and pleasures than they do God. Because if they cared about God, the sins they would committed, they would be bringing down to the altar all the time saying, God, please have mercy on us as a church. Please have mercy on me. I'm a deacon. I'm a pastor. God, please have mercy on me. But they don't do that anymore. They just pass it over and make it like, well, God loves us all and God wouldn't do this. And, and it's okay if you live this way. He's saying that to you because he lives that way. And he knows he can't condemn you or he'd be condemning himself. And this is the world, people, that we are living in right now. We're pushing the time and bringing it forward to us where the abomination that brings desolation is coming. Because people love sin more than they love anything else in this world, including God and including other, other people. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Oh, they read a lot of books from the Christian bookstore. And they give a lot of teachings. They're teaching, of course, now with COVID, most of the churches are streaming online, right? So now they're streaming online so everybody can see what's going on inside their church. And they say, oh, we got a new, brand new teaching today. Nobody's ever heard of this ever. And, and I got it because I got a book. And, I, and this book was, I, I bought this book at the recommendation from another pastor and this book has literally changed my life. And I guarantee you, they spent way more time studying that book than they did even reading this one. If they would read this book and believe it, they wouldn't be getting their sermons out of some other book. And I can tell you, uh, Roger Oakland and some others did some fantastic research. They found out that these large publishing companies went and looked and hired authors that would specifically turn the churches of this country and around the world into a new and a different direction other than the traditions laid down to us by our forefathers from this King James Bible. They did it on purpose. Do you know why? Because these large publishing companies, companies were bought out by big conglomerates who had an agenda of changing what church was all about. And it wasn't hard to find pastors who were revolutionaries and way out there. And they promoted these as the guys you got to really listen to. And so more often than not, the pastor of the local churches that are in your area, they're not getting their sermons directly from the Word of God. They're not reading this book, studying this book, meditating on this book, asking God to give them inspiration for this book so they can preach. They've got books to read. And they get their sermons almost word for word from these other books. So they think they know a lot about God ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So you see the setup? Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. 
love for common man, your fellow man, and any love that they had for God gone completely out the window because sin has crept in so heavily into the churches and into this country that we're nearing the time. We're not there yet, but we are getting near the time when people are reprobate. There is no chance whatsoever that they can ever be converted to Jesus Christ. Not a chance. Now, here's what, so we've, we've gone from what Jesus said back to what was going on in the days of Noah. Paul agrees. Jesus agrees. Moses agreed when he wrote about the days of Noah. And now we bring Peter and Jude into it. And are they going to tell us anything different? No. They're going to tell us the exact same thing. And they're all giving different examples and different things that to look for to tell us that we're nearing the time when a day comes when the abomination of desolation is finally revealed. 2 Peter chapter 2, let's pick it up in verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Let me stop right here. I'm not anti-government. You will never, ever find me being anti-government. God gives government to mankind because mankind must be ruled. Romans chapter 13 means what Romans chapter 13 means and not what anybody else makes it to mean. There are people over us. There are police who patrol our streets. And did you know that not all of those policemen are born again King James Bible believers? But they carry a badge. They bear the sword in the form of a gun. And if they get behind you and turn their lights on, you have to pull over. Even as a Christian, you may say, I only recognize godly authority. Excuse me. God gave that cop that badge and that gun. Now, just because he has one does not make him a more moral man than you are or more saved than you are. But when it comes to protecting the citizens, most policemen in this country are doing the, th the thing and the job the right way. But here's what you have. When you have the governor of Georgia and you have a vast majority of the Congress of Georgia and when you have a vast majority of the people counting the votes in Georgia who know that they're cheating in the election, they despise government, don't they? The rules don't apply to them. They couldn't care less about election rules, election laws, when the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania refused to even hear the case and then wrote down, we are furthermore saying that we have adjudicated this, that there's nothing to this, and as at this point, nothing else can be done. Period. The end. We have spoken. That shows that they despise government too. Now, I'm also going to say this. I know of way too many people who claim they are Christians who have concocted in their mind that all government is run by the Illuminati, therefore they don't have to listen to any earthly government. You're just as rebellious as the other people are, and if you continue in that course, you're going to go get a mark in your right hand or forehead. Guaranteed. Chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Notice that he sets it up with sin first. Because of the abundance of sin in your life, this is what you will do. Despise government. Maybe, maybe you don't want 
the government to have any power over you because of some of the things that you download on your computer. Is that even possible? Yeah, it is. Presumptuous are they. You know what that means? I can sin all I want to. And God still has to take me to heaven. That's presumptuous. Self-willed. That means they don't follow the Bible. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And again, and that goes along with despising government. I unfortunately had, and I say this because I feel sorry for the guy. He followed my ministry. He loved me to death. But he was so fiercely anti-government. He had a felony background, meaning that he's not allowed to have firearms. And the police went to check on him one day, and he opened fire on them, and they shot him dead. That made me very sad. At his mom's house. He lived at his mom's house. Folks, I wept for that guy. You know why? Because he was guilty of exactly what Second Peter said. He despised government, was not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And it obviously had to do with the sin that was still in his life, whatever it was. But you start to see now how this works with the abundance of and the increase of sin in a person's life, rules don't matter anymore. Laws, they don't matter anymore. People just start becoming violent. They start only thinking of themselves and not caring about anybody else. He opened fire on two policemen who were sent out to do their job, policemen who had wives and children at home. He didn't care. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. But these as natural brute beast. I want you to understand that. He means exactly what he says. Made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things that they understand not. And shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots are they, spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Do you remember me talking about what incontinent means? means they have absolutely no control over what they do. And when a person is constantly feeding on adulterous images, remember, their eyes are full of adultery. That means they're always going around giving women the looks. And they're waiting for the woman to look back. Because if the woman looks back and they catch each other's eyes, that's sort of a thing where, well, maybe that woman's interested in me and the woman's thinking, hey, that guy's interested in me. That's what having eyes full of adultery is. There's, it's like it's, they're not saying each other out loud, hey, I want to have adultery with you. Is that okay? They don't have to say it. 
It's in the eyes. They have eyes full of adultery, and it says they cannot cease from sin. Let me give you this illustration. These is natural brute beasts that cannot cease from sin. Now, God gave it over to deer, dogs, fish, birds, lions, you name it. That to them, there's no marriage ceremony. There's no premarital counseling. There's nobody that they don't go to their parents and say, uh, Father Lion, I have this female lion. I would like for your permission to marry her. There's none of that. They're beasts. They just pick one, go to town with it. You see, we're humans, though. We have rules that God gave us that are expected to be followed before we mate. There must be a lifelong commitment made that just those two people, male and female, and only those two people, male and female, make a vow that they're going to be with one another until death parts them and that they will never have another mate step in their marriage. See, that's what elevates us above being beasts. But when it comes to animals, well, when it's mating season, you just can't stop them and they can't stop themselves they're going to do it they cannot cease from doing what they're doing which in many cases is the reason why we have to take some people and put them in prison for the rest of their life because they cannot cease from sin they're beasts I had a preacher uh, illustrate it like this. Let's say that a guy breaks into your house and he's walking down the hallway to your room, three o'clock in the morning, you're dead asleep, and you have a dog, and he's laying there just sort of off in a room. He's asleep too. He doesn't hear the guy. And the guy walks by and steps on the paw of the dog. What's the dog going to do? He's going to wake up. He's going to start squelching to the top of his lungs, squeaking and arr, 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 And he's going to go after the guy that's coming down to your room. Will he be able to make a choice not to do that? No. It's in his nature. Whereas if I hear a guy coming in my house, and I decide to hide in that room because I know he's going down the hall. And I'm going to wait for him to get right by me. And I got a big baseball bat or a gun in my hand. And he happens to step on my toe. And I don't want him to know I'm there. Can I refrain myself from screaming out loud? Yes. I can do that. Just so that I can catch him by surprise. That's one of the differences between us and beasts. Beasts have a nature that they cannot go against. And what we're talking about, this is what's leading up to the abomination that maketh desolation. It's that people will get to a point where they literally will become like beasts. They will have, they will no longer have human nature, which is bad enough. They will have 
beast nature which cannot be controlled. They cannot cease from sin. So he says, these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not, like the King James Bible, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. There's a lot here. Spots they are in blemishes, natural brute beasts. In fact, he also says, Jude does, almost says the exact same thing about them. Jude, there's only one chapter there, verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beast. That's exactly what Peter said in 2 Peter verse 12. These as natural brute beast. Jude again, verse 10. But what they know naturally as brute beast, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity. Well, that's what he says back in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Spots they are and blemishes. These are spots in your feast of charity. And when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead. I'll explain that later. Plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars. I wonder what that means. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now notice he said, twice dead. What does that mean? Well, we know that we can be born once and we can be born twice. We can be born of our earthly father, but as Jesus told, told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Jesus and Nicodemus inquired of Jesus, what in the world does that mean? How can I go in my mother's womb the second time? He said, you don't understand. That which is born of water is uh, flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. He was talking about the second birth given to us by our heavenly Father. Remember what Peter said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So I think Peter is telling us that there is two births of being born again and living, and then a transformation, sort of like a birth, that takes place by means of corruptible seed, and the people actually at that point become twice dead. Jesus said almost the exact same thing. Let me find this here. I just, I just had this thought. This, this, this just in from God. In Matthew chapter 23. Yeah. Because he tells that he's talking about the Pharisees. And he's talking about how their false doctrine leads people astray. And he tells the people, do what they tell you to do, but don't follow after their deeds. And he says, because of their, de because of their teachings and their doctrine, they can make somebody a twofold more child of hell worse off than they ever were before hearing their doctrine a twofold child of hell 
You see, when you're born once, you're born automatically to go to hell. Because you've inherited a sin nature, you are going to sin. And once you've reached the age of accountability, you start knowing the difference between good and evil. You're going to be judged for every one of those. But then there comes a certain point where a person becomes a twofold child of hell. Recipients of the what he said here, twice dead, which means that God, even though they're still alive on this earth, God has already adjudicated them as being recipients of the second death, which is being cast into the lake of fire. So there can literally be people in this world right now who have become so reprobate in their mind that God knows there is absolutely no chance whatsoever of them ever converting, apologizing, repenting, and being converted into a Christian. God says, not only are they already recipients of the first death, they are already recipients of the second death, and they're still walking around on the earth. No chance of redeeming them. They're not ever going to change. That's what he says. And so I think that on the day that the abomination of desolation takes place, it, will be be, it won't be because everybody's praying against it and hoping it never happens. It'll be because everybody on this earth already twice dead because they've received a mark in their right hand or in their forehead willingly because sin has brought them to that point that those people are already twice dead and now God is going to bring into this earth the abomination of desolation. He's going to reveal, I believe, the, who the man of sin is, the son of perdition, and everybody's going to go, Yay! He's finally here. While God's saints, if we are allowed to be here on that day, will say, that's the man of sin, the son of perdition. We may try to warn people. They don't care. Because they're not going to listen to it. So, we have people who are twice dead, and both Peter and Jude mention that they are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. So we're talking about human souls here. The, the people that I, God actually made different than all of the angels, or excuse me, all of the creatures of the earth were different than dogs, gorillas, chimpanzees, goldfish, chipmunks, paramecium, you name it. We're different from all of them because God gave us a living soul. He breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. So you have to ask yourself, is it even possible that a human being can be turned into a beast? Yep. And God's already done it as a warning to the rest of the world, don't follow in this man's footsteps or I'll do the same thing to you. What man is he talking about? If you haven't figured it out already, it's Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 13, I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven, and he cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off his branches and shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls up from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. And then notice this, let his 
heart. The heart, I believe, is the soul of man. Where his soul resides, where, where he really, who he really is, is his heart. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Now, some might say, well, that was just a, you know, like a metaphor. It's like he went a little crazy for seven years. I might be inclined to think that too. Had it not been for the actual fact that God actually gave him the physical attributes of a beast. Notice in verse 33, the same hour. That's an interesting verse, 33, that this happened. Because the phrase, the beast, is mentioned 33 times in the New Testament, the King James Bible. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. So let's count this up here. He did eat grass as oxen, we're going to find four things, by the way. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. His hairs grew like eagle's feathers. And his nails like bird's claws. You see, four always counts for spiritual kingdom, fourth dimension, things of the spirit realm. The fourth kingdom where they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. It also has to do with a false gospel. Now, I think the false gospel, rather than saving someone to be born again of incorruptible seed, they are born again of corruption. And I believe that that second birth with that outside seed coming into their souls literally turns human beings into beasts. Because that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Now God, after the seven times passed over him, God redeemed him, set him upright, returned his mind, his heart to him, and he realized what he had done, and he said, oh, I shouldn't have said that seven, seven years ago. I shouldn't have said that I did all this. God, I'm sorry, you're the only real God, and I believe Nebuchadnezzar is in heaven. I believe we'll meet him in heaven. I think he finally got to where his heart's right with God. It took four chapters to do it, okay? Four gospels, four chapters, but I think he's there. But God had to put him in a place where he literally took his mind away from him and he literally became a wild animal for seven times. If you say that seven years, that's fine because that's what I think it is. But for however long that was, Nebuchadnezzar was a beast. He even looked like one. Did he have control over his urges, his faculties? Do you think... He said, uh, where's the bathroom? It was just wherever he was. He was a beast in every sense of the word. And I think that when the fourth kingdom mingles themselves with the seed of men, that it's going to do something very similar to mankind. Look in uh, Psalm 92, verse 4. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the work of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man, the word brute means he's a beast. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. So people who 
are beast-like. They don't know anything about, about God. They don't care anything about God. They don't think about their creator. All they do is think about themselves. Let's examine the animal kingdom for a minute. Do animals care, for the most part, about other animals? Do lions care about the gazelle population? Do they try to refrain themselves from killing too many gazelles? Because after all, we have to worry about them as well. Do they care? Nah. You know, even the motherly impulse that's in the, the mother of practically every beast in the world. After a while, the mothers just simply don't care about their own cubs. They just walk away from them. And they could kill them if they wanted to. That's a beast nature. Did you know that God said there would come a time when human beings would be eating their own children because of the famine. That's a brute beast nature. Psalm 94, 7. Yet they say the Lord shall not see, neither shall the Lord of God, Lord God of Jacob, regard it. Understand, ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear shall he not hear, and he that formed the eye shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen shall he not correct? And he that teacheth man knowledge shall he not know? And he speaks this, he tries to speak understanding to the brutish among the people, and he calls them fools. And he says, when will you be wise? Again, brutish people don't care anything about anybody else but themselves and especially they don't care about God at all. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 8 they are all together brutish and foolish. That's like the third time in a row we've seen those two things put together. In Psalm 92, a brutish man knoweth not, neither doth the fool understand this. In Psalm 94, ye brutish among the people, and ye fools. Jeremiah 10, they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock, which is like a piece of wood, a stick, is a doctrine of vanities. And he's talking about making idols out of wood. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. The work of the workmen and the hands of the founder, blue and purple, is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. You know what he's kind of getting at here? People that pray to idols are already well on their way to becoming brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Then he says this, Jeremiah 10, 14, every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder, that's an idol maker, is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. See, there it is. He's saying, that people who pray to idols, who have idols as part of their religion, or Paul would say those who are simply covetous. Covetousness is idolatry, Paul said. They're already well on their way to becoming natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. And when the whole of the earth finally gets there, that's when the abomination of desolation is going to take place. Jeremiah 10, 21. Here it is. For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. Who's going to scatter the flocks? The brute pastors. Why? 
because the flocks then realize that all the pastors are just after them. I have a friend who started going to a church, and the pastor there, they had a big write-up in the, in the local paper about him, about how he was going to be there at that church, and he was going to really build that church, and they were going to do new things in that church, and they were going to build it into a, a big congregation, and they were really going to do new things there. In, in other words, they were really going to change the music, bring in rock and roll music, and they were going to do all this and do that. The guy told me, he said, we weren't there six months, and the pastor made two passes at my wife. And he said, I went over to the church one night, found out that the church computer that the pastor used was full of porn. The pastor was having several affairs with women in that church at the same time. Brutish. Beasts unbeguiling, unstable souls that cannot cease from sin. And I bet that happens everywhere. I bet it does. See, the pastors then prey on their own sheep. No wonder they scatter and run. Jeremiah 51, 17. Every man is brutish by his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. Now, I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. But I've got a sneaky suspicion that before too long, practically all of the churches that God has already assigned over to having Ichabod written over them, which means the glory is departed, that somehow, some way, they're going to give way to idol worship. Now again, I don't know how it's going to happen. I just look at verses like this. Every man is brutish by his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. I just think that the lack of pure doctrine from pure Bibles eventually leads churches who at one time would never have images in their church to put an image in their church of some kind. I don't know how it's going to happen. I just think it's going to happen. Now, we know that sin and the abundance of sin leads up to all of this, uh, the people getting to the point to where they will accept the abomination of desolation. So how does it happen? That people who one day they act human, think human, have souls like human beings, what happens in them that they become natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed? Actually pretty simple. Romans 1, verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. In 2 Timothy 3, 8, Paul said, Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So, it's actually pretty simple. You know how it happens? Every day that they believe less and less of the Bible 
and it is a process. It, it just doesn't happen overnight, which is why we don't just see it happen overnight. We don't see a vibrant, Bible-believing, soul-winning church. All of a sudden, the next day, they bring in a statue of Mary and everybody goes, oh, hallelujah, let's pray to that. It doesn't happen that way. The devil's very patient. He knows that it takes years. I've watched serpents sneak up on prey. I've watched other animals like leopards and cheetahs and lions. They'll spend all day slowly but surely moving up to a herd of something just so they can get one of them out of there. And they're patient enough to do it all day long. You see, the younger ones, they always blow it. They always jump ahead of time, run the whole flock off. Now everybody's got to starve another day. But the older ones, they'll wait all day long for that meal. And that's how it works. You see, back in 1978, when the NIV came out as both the Old and New Testament together, people didn't make too much deal about it. Well, you know, it's close to the Bible, and actually, we don't see any harm. And, you know, this church has been around for years. We're preaching the good old time way. Don't worry about us. Well, that was 1978. Where are they? See, 78, 88, 98, 2008, 2018. It's 40, 42 years ago. Now, 43 years ago. Where are they now? These same churches that 43 years ago started using the NIV and they were rock solid in their doctrine. Where are they now, 43 years later? They're well on their way to becoming brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. And so surely what Jesus said, because iniquity, iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Animals don't love anybody but themselves. And animals don't love God. And as sin increases and this Bible decreases, you're going to start seeing more and more people and churches becoming beast-like in their nature. And it's all going to get to a point to where the abomination of desolation is going to take place. And the people that are going to embrace this will never see it coming because they've been blinded for so long. And now they get to a point that they don't care that it's the devil. They just think it's God and think it's wonderful. Don't become like that. Hold on to this Bible. I don't care if it's your worst day ever. Hold on to this Bible. Okay? Don't ever let it go. I've got more about what Jude said and what Peter said that sort of tie into this. And you'll want to see that as we get into the teaching, the abomination of desolation. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Keep praying for our ministry. Keep praying for the good people of Kenya and those around the world who benefit from the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.